Now we move on to diffraction. So we're going to start by talking about single slit diffraction. And much of the way that we think about single slit diffraction is very similar to what happens with double slit diffraction, which is part of why we do it first. Now, remember, we're thinking about, well, we have to think about both ways of, of conceptualizing light. You can think about it either as a, as a particle where it travels in a straight direction like a ray, or you can think of it as a wave, and both are valid, and both are useful in different scenarios. So if you think about it as a wave, and a wave travels, it hits a, um, it hits a pathway where it can't, it has an opening, and only some, the wave can only go through some of the opening. When it comes out, it's a, like a single source of a wave, but what it can do is it can actually interfere with itself. And, um, we're going to use Halkin's principle to understand why that happens. Remember that with Halkin's principle, we can think about a, uh, a line source of light as being a bunch of individual sources. So now, instead of having um, a single source when we think about our slit, we can think about it as a bunch of little different slits. And then we're going to look at the slit here compared to the slit there. Um, and when we have, uh, when the slit here, um, so sorry, when the, the top of the slit, we're going to compare the ray coming from the top of the slit to the ray coming from the center of the slit. Um, and the um, when you have the ray coming from the center of the slit, this is half a wavelength off from that ray. What happens is this ray cancels out that ray, this ray cancels out that ray, this ray cancels out that ray, and I think this has an odd number of rays, but so you end up getting exactly destructive interference. So then we can say when uh, V sine theta, the, uh, let's see, D, here this is D over two sine theta, when this is equal to an integer number of half wavelengths, then we get destructive interference. So we end up with the same equation that we had in the last chapter, but now instead of being for constructive interference, it is for destructive interference. All right. And then we can talk about the intensity. So we see similar, a similar structure to what we saw with the double slit experiment. We see a central maximum. And then when we have, uh, when we have traveled a distance lambda um, over two, we'll get a minimum. And then when we've traveled, we'll, so we uh, travel from the central maximum and then we add another whole wavelength and you get another minimum and then you get another minimum. Um, so uh, you have a similar structure, except now this is from a single slit. So the, the beam of light is actually interfering with itself. Um, here you can, see, uh, you can see schematically what it looks like, um, where as you travel out towards the screen, you have a central maximum, and then you have the distribution of the intensity as a function of position along the screen. And um, your book does this, so I won't, I won't go through the derivation, um, but the intensity as a function of the angle is given by sine beta over beta, quantity squared, where beta is pi times a, which is the, the width of the slit, um, times sine of theta, the angle al along the screen, divided by the wavelength. So here we have the intensity exactly. Um, 
So then if you look at the distribution of intensity as a function of degrees, um, and then this is for a slit width exactly equal to the wavelength. When the slit width is exactly equal to the wavelength, you don't see much of a structure. You move to a slit width which is five times the wavelength, and then you start to see a central maximum. A slit width which is ten times the wavelength, you start to see a central maximum and some fringes. All right, now, if we look in greater detail at the double slit experiment, now we're going to look at a case where the, both the width of the slit and the separation between the slits are comparable to the wavelength. So when we considered the double slit in the previous chapter, we were considering, although I didn't emphasize it, we were considering the slits to be narrow compared to their separation. And now we're looking at slits which are comparable to the wavelength and comparable to their separation. So this is, let me, let me use the fatter markers. So now you have slits that are on the order of their separation and on the order of the wavelength or a few times the wavelength. And then when you look on the screen, um, this is showing an example um, where the slit width is um, twice the wavelength and the separation is six times the wavelength, you will actually see both patterns. So this shows what you would get for the, um, this shows the pattern that you would get for the, um, the double slit, and this shows what you would get for the single slit, and so you will see the double slit pattern modulated by the single slit pattern. All right, and we can repeat this with multiple slits, um, and that is called a diffraction grating. So now, instead of having, um, instead of having one or two uh, slits, you have a lot of slits. And when you do this, you're adding up the interference pattern from all of those different slits from both the, the effect of the single slit interference and the double slit interference. And um, when you have a large number of slits, you approach having only the principal maxima, um, and those are very, very bright, and there are very narrow lines. And that's because, I didn't point it out here, uh, sometimes, so if you're, um, if both, if either function, the single slit or the double slit interference is at a minimum, then uh, you don't see the maxima even if they would regularly be there. So here you see a missing, um, a missing fringe from the third order double slit pattern. So if you add enough slits to make a diffraction grating, eventually a lot of those slits will actually be um, missing. And the equation that is followed is still d sine theta equals m lambda. All right, and you can make these with, for instance, by carving glass with a very sharp tool um, so that you get very thin slits. And, of course, there's a wavelength dependence. So if you pass light through a diffraction grating, if you pass light which is not monochromatic through a diffraction grating, you will get separation by the, um, by the colors. So here's if you pass white light through the diffraction grating. Um, but you also can use this, for instance, when you're looking at the, um, the light produced by excited atoms. Uh, and this is how you can identify, for instance, the light emitted by hy hydrogen atoms in a hydrogen gas. So uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have a diffraction grating, you're going to see the separation of light into colors. All right, and this is just showing, showing more of the same. And then we can talk about a circular aperture. So when you have a circular aperture, like what you would have in a telescope or in a pinhole camera, um, you have, if you have monochromatic light passing through it, 
you will in fact get a circular diffraction pattern. Um, and it's a little hard to see on this, uh, on this image, but it's concentric circles where you will see that bright maximum and then you're gonna see disks around it where you get maxima. Because now, instead of being uh, a thin slit and you'll get maxima on your screen at every point, now you have a thin point and you're going to get angular maxima and, and minima where the, um, where the light from different parts of the disk can interact constructively. Now, if you have two uh, sources that are very close to each other, they can produce overlapping images. And this, uh, if they get close enough, you cannot actually resolve them. And this is an effect that you have to consider when you're looking at telescopes or microscopes. How close can two objects be while you can still, for you to still be able to resolve them? Um, and here, this shows the graph of the intensity of the diffraction pattern as a function of the angular distance for a circular aperture. Um, and similar to the single slit, you've got the central maximum, which is much wider and brighter than those off to the side. And if you have two objects, they are going to produce um, overlapping diffraction patterns. All right, and this leads to a criterion for you to be able to distinguish two objects. This is very relevant when you're considering antenna as well as telescopes and uh, as well as telescopes and microscopes. So you can resolve two objects if the um, if the angular separation is one and a half. Uh, 1.22 times lambda over the size of the aperture. So here you can see two points separated by some distance, um, and you can uh, calculate a resolving power for the lens and an object at that point. Now we can move to X-ray diffraction. Um, so. Here you can see an image produced when you have a when you have X-rays. Actually, because you can't see X-rays, you have to use film that tells you where the X-rays were. Um, so this is the pattern produced by shining shining X-rays on a crystal of proteins, um, and you can actually use that interference pattern to figure out the structure of the crystal, which is how we figured out the structure of what of DNA. All right. So when you have light incident upon a crystal. It's similar to a diffraction grating, except now you've got a 3D structure. So again, you can look at two light rays. Um, we're going to think of a crystal as, uh, as cubes uh, separated by a distance A. So other, there's some, uh, sorry, this one is separated by a distance D. So you then have, again, a separation D sine theta so the path length difference between the two rays works out to be 2d sine theta. And when that path length difference is equal to an integer number of wavelengths, you get constructive interference, just like what we've seen in this chapter in the previous chapter. And so in three dimensions, you have a regular crystal structure. This shows what happens if you simply have a cubic structure, but of course, you will also get diffraction patterns if you have a much more complicated structure. All right, we can move on to a few examples. Um, here, you can see uh, the central part of an interference pattern for a pure wavelength of red light. Now, note that the color changed on the slides, projected onto a double slit. The pattern is a combination of the single and double slit experience, I I interference. Note that the bright spots are evenly sp spaced. Is this a double slit or single slit characteristic? Note that there are some bright spots, note that some of the bright spots are dim on either side of the center. Is that a single slit or double slit characteristic? All right. The evenly spaced lines are a 
double slit characteristic um, because this double slit gives you nice, neat, evenly spaced maxima, while the dimness of some of the lines comes from the um, comes from the single slit interference pattern. And you can see here that we in fact see both, and they're comparable. All right, here you see. The analysis shown above applies to diffraction gratings with lines separated by a distance d. What is the distance between fringes produced by a diffraction grating ha having 125 lines per centimeter for 200 nanometer light if the screen is 1.5 meters away? So we're going to break this down. Um, so we have, we are asked for the difference between the fringes, and then the separation of the fringes is, so we have 125 lines per centimeter. So in each centimeter, we have 125 lines. So that's our separation, 10 to the negative two meters or one centimeter, divided by 125. Um, we have lambda, equals 600 nanometer light or 6 times 10 to the negative 7 meters and the screen d is 1.5 meters away and here i'm going to write it as three halves and hope that the numbers work out to be um, to be equal and it's asking for what is the distance between the fringes it's asking for the distance and not the angular position. So here I'm going to have to use my small angle approximation. So d sine theta equals m lambda, or uh, this I can write as d delta y over the distance to the screen. Um, and I am asked for delta y. So actually, let me call it y initially. And then I'm, if I look at two neighboring fringes, then the two neighboring fringes have m equals d delta y over capital D or delta y equals d, capital D over lowercase d, times the wavelength, which is 3 halves times 10 to the negative 2 over 125 times 6 times 10 to the negative seventh. All right, then I can cancel this out and that leaves me with a three. So I have three times three times 125 times 10 to the negative fifth because this comes upstairs and cancels out two of those orders of magnitude. And this is equal to 0 0.01125 meters, or about one, a little bit more than one centimeter. And that concludes our chapter on diffraction. Hope you found it illuminating.